We've a psychological thriller now on BBC Radio 4 for the Saturday play from one of Britain's finest post-war crime writers. The Colour of Murder by Julian Simmons Dramatised by Yvonne Antrobus All of this happened just because I went round to change a library book. Just two months ago. Was it? Tell me about it. Well, I came home from work and found May, my wife, lying down with one of her migraines. But the trouble was her library book was due back that day. If we didn't return it, there would be a tuppenny fine. May was a good housewife. Careful. So I did as she said and went to Clapham Library. The girl at the desk was new. Pretty. Dark. Rather plump. And she was smiling at me. Is that all? Yes. Uh, no. You want to take another book out? Yes. Y yes, I do. I... Do you have any books by Moira Malabaro? Uh, <laughs> we might have. Are you a fan? Oh, no. For my sister. The book's for my sister. <laughs> She's an invalid. Reads a lot. I like Somerset Maugham myself. Of course. Well, how about... I told her a lie, pretending that May was my sister. I don't know why I did that. Princess make-believe. It's only just come in. I'm sure she hasn't. Thank you. Yeah? As I took it, her hands touched and I felt a kind of thrill go up my arm. It really is most kind of you to take so much trouble when there are others who must need your yes. help. Now, next please. Can I help you? The following day I went to work feeling quite different, confident. It was the way the girl had smiled at me. They don't often do that. You worked in Paling's department store in Oxford Street. Assistant manager of the complaints department. I carried a great deal of responsibility. Okay. In my office immediately. Yes, Mr. Gimbal. And how are you today? I'm fine, sir. No more blackouts? No more lost afternoons? Absolutely not, sir. They were before Christmas. I'd been out to lunch. And how do you explain these? What? Three letters of complaint. One pair of stockings... One pullover, one case of insolence in the soda fountain. Unanswered. Well? This is the first I've seen of them, Mr Gimble. Miss Murchison says they've been on your desk for over a week. I do sort of remember something. Yes? I remember thinking I must answer them, only... everything goes all dark after that. I was meant to go into the family business. Engineering. My father never understood... What didn't he understand? Uh, the army. I was keen to go into the army. I volunteered. I, I once asked the drill corporal for an extra hour's tuition, and you know what he said to me? What? He said, You know, Wilkins, you try too hard. Hmm? Can there ever be such a thing as trying too hard? <laughs> then there was this big, tough fellow called Gibson. He used to drink a lot, and one night he said to me, Wilkins, who's the biggest crawler in the squad? I took no notice, but he went on. Say it, Wilkins, say. I'm the biggest crawler in the squad. That was when I punched him on the jaw and his friends set on me. I went into town and drank some beer and didn't get back until the next day. That was when I had my first blackout. And the family business? My father was killed by a V2 in 1945. And when I went through his affairs, well, there was nothing left. So my mother and I had to move out of Kincaid Square and I got a job at Palings. That was where I met May. Tell me about her. She asked me to dance. I'm not all that good at dancing, but it was a sports club do, so I went along. May told me that she worked in accounts... And she had nice legs. What did you talk about? Uh, she said, 
You live in one of those big houses in Kincaid Square, don't you, John? And I told her that we didn't anymore. She went a bit quiet after that. So I asked her where she lived, and she just laughed and said it wasn't nearly as grand as Kincaid Square. It was funny, but from then on, May and I just kept bumping into one another. And three months later, we were married. Oh, thank goodness that's over for another week. It would have been a very pleasant evening if you hadn't insisted on upsetting Mother as usual. Me? Upset her? Well, that's very nice. Don't think I didn't hear what she said when you were stuffing yourself with steak and kidney pudding. And what she meant when she said it. What did she say? It's not as though he gets it very often, May. Once a week's not going to hurt him. And then your Uncle Dan. Once a week? I shouldn't think he's ever had it once a week. Nasty, vulgar old man. Yes, well, if you will take things the wrong way. What other way was there to take it? Humiliating me. And don't tell me you didn't see your mother smirk. My mother has never smirked in her life. <laughs> That's right, just take a sign like you always oh. do. You all think you're superior to me. Stop it. Stop she it. She hates me, your mother. She thinks you married beneath you. You do too, don't you? You hate me too, Mummy's boy. Shut up. No! Sorry. I, I don't want to hurt you. You know that, May, don't you? Don't you, May? Stop it, don't, please. Not in here. No, not with the light on. What, 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 what I want oh, I to do... Oh, sick. What, what, what I want to do is, is, is just... Oh, oh. oh that food. It excited me when she cried. I was only 21 when I married. A bit innocent, I suppose. And I had this dream of what our life together would be like. And May, up with the birds in the morning, getting breakfast, then dressed all crisp in a little check pinafore when I came home at night, bringing my slippers and putting, taking kidney pudding between us on the table. And afterwards, when she'd washed up, We'd sit by the fire where I told her about my day and stroked her hair. But I wanted to do things. Things I was ashamed of. Then I read some psychologists in the Kinsey report and realised that I wasn't really so different from other people. Miss Morton. I'm sorry? Your name. It's on this little sign. <laughs> there. <laughs> Sheila Morton. And my name's John Wilkins. So, how can I help you, Mr Wilkins? Uh, I wondered what you did in the evenings. Do you go out ever? <laughs> well, if someone asks me. So? Would you like to go out next Tuesday? I'm sorry. I'm already doing something then. I've got complimentary tickets for the detective play at the Princess Theatre. A relative of mine's a theatrical manager, and I often get well, it's tickets. Very sweet of you. I'd love to have seen that play. What but... about the Tuesday after then? Um, Are you doing anything that evening? No, no, I don't think so. That is the Tuesday after it is then. That was the second lie I told to Sheila. Why did I keep doing that? Uh, May. I'm going to be rather late home on Tuesday. Oh? Why? Mr Lacey, one of the directors, wants to talk to me. Could take the whole evening. Oh, John. That must mean he's taking you out to dinner. It must be something really important, like a promotion. Do you think you ought to dress? No, I'm sure it's nothing like that. It must be. Promotion. We might be able to buy a car. A little Ford Popular, or one of those Morris Miners. Oh, quite a lot of our friends have them, and I've really felt quite ashamed sometimes of the way we're always getting lifts. But you don't care how I feel, do you? M May, I do. I, and I really do wish I could buy a car. Well, it would have been so convenient for Tuesday. For Tuesday? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Convenient. <laughs> Don't you think you ought to finish that washing up before the water gets cold? <clears throat> oh, and John, when you're with Mr Lacey, watch out you don't have too much to drink. We don't want it bringing on one of your fits.
play was something about a man planning the perfect murder and how it all goes wrong. But I hadn't been able to concentrate. I was too conscious of Sheila sitting close to me in the darkness. Of how every now and then her arms touched. Complimentary tickets always have the word stamped on. It was sweet of you, but you shouldn't have done it. Didn't you enjoy the play? Well, it wasn't as good as I'd hoped. Sorry. I like your dress. It matches your eyes. Oh. Blue. Like the sea. <laughs> Are you really sure you don't want to eat? No, no. My father's not very well, so I'd like to get home. I'm sorry. About your father, I mean. Yes. He had a heart attack, so... Well, anyway, my mother's dead, so I'm all he's got. He's very lucky. No. He's all I've got, too, except for Bill. But he's working up in Birmingham now. That's my cousin, Bill Lonergan. I used to know Bill Lonergan at school. At the grammar? Well, that would be him. He lived in Clapham until a couple of years ago. I do miss him. He was mad, but sweet, too, if you know what I mean. He was like a big brother to me. He was certainly big. <laughs> yes. I clean bowled him once, uh, and he picked up a great chunk of iron railing from beside the pitch and threw it at me. <laughs> I can still hear it whistling past my head. Yes, Bill was mad, all right. He drove off in somebody's car once, just for a dare. They'd left the ignition key in, and he hadn't even got a licence. You were in the cricket team then? Yes. Rugby and tennis, too. I don't remember you. I was a pretty useful bat and first-change bowler. One year I took most wickets, and another I headed the bowling averages. Oh. Let's get a taxi. What? A taxi. That's what we need. All the way to Clapham? Just the two of us. T taxi! No, no, it's easier to go by tube. Taxi! Taxi! Look out, you idiot. I'm already taken. Can't you pop the meter? His light was on. I know he wasn't taken. Doesn't matter. He turned his meter over just as I got there, just as I was overtaking him. John, don't try so hard. What? Come on, let's take the tube. What did you say? I like the tube. No, before that, uh, what did you say? I said don't try so hard. Let's take the tube. Well, I hope the evening wasn't too much of a disappointment for you. I probably shouldn't have come. Oh, no. You should. Well, it doesn't have no, to John, be over. I'm sorry. No, John, please don't. <laughs> Sheila. Let me go, will you? I'm sorry. Good night, Mr. Wilkins. Sheila! It was all May's fault. She didn't like, you know, the intimate side of things. But with Sheila, it was quite different. Are you saying you had sex with Sheila Morton? No. I dreamed. I dreamed I was winning races, scoring a century, fighting duels, even, and Sheila was my prize. So I joined the Evesdale. Which is? The local tennis club. May was always on at me to join. Not that she cared a bit about tennis, but it's who you play with. It's important, she kept saying. Uncle Dan was a member, so I went down there with him one Saturday afternoon. Hey, Roger, want to make up a fall for a mixed? <laughs> oh, sorry, Jack, I fixed up already. Oh, that's a shame. I'm feeling in good form. <laughs> I looked over my shoulder, and there, with another girl, was Sheila. Smiling up at this great big blonde man. Oh, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I'm not mixed up. I'd like a game very much. Very much. That is, if I'm not butting in. And who are you? Why, John! I didn't know you were a member here. Oh, you know, indeed. Yes. And we do need a fourth, don't we, Leslie? We spun rackets for partners. Sheila's and mine came down rough so that we were together. It all felt like one of those dreams I'd been having about Sheila, and I knew that I was going to better than I ever played in my life. I have a really hard first service when it goes in, and this afternoon it went in all the time. 
Sheila was quite a useful player, but she hardly touched the ball. It wasn't until we'd played a couple of games in the second set, after winning the first, and I noticed a strange atmosphere on the court. Don't try so hard. This isn't the Davis Cup, and you might let me see the ball sometimes. That broke my dream. And my game. We lost the second set and didn't play a decider. I was glad when we returned to the clubhouse. Hello, Johnny boy. I hear you electrified him on the court just now. Yeah, he's a real dynamo. Can I buy you a drink? No, thanks. Um, Sheila? You didn't tell me you were married, John. There was no need to invent an invalid sister. But I suppose you had to think of some reason for taking out books by Moira Malevra. <laughs> <laughs> Next day at Palings, I relived every moment of that shame and Humiliation. At three o'clock, I said I felt ill and was going home. But instead, I wandered into Soho, then into a little club where Uncle Dan had once taken me and drank several glasses of whiskey. And then suddenly it was seven o'clock. And I remembered that today was Wednesday, the day for going to see Mother. I'm so sorry, but... I had to work late. Is May here? Yes, May is here. Would you like to go upstairs and wash? What's that? Just go upstairs and wash. I went up to the little bathroom and turned on the hot water tap, confronting myself in the glass. And there I saw, on my left cheek, the distinct imprint of a pair of red lips. I washed it off and went downstairs, shaking. When did those lips make contact with my face? What's this I hear about you being friendly with Sheila Morton? I played tennis with her on Saturday. Her father's that timber merchant on Grayling Road. He's a wealthy man. Pity you didn't make friends with her a few years ago. May never should have married me. Watching May eat toast and marmalade was what made me feel sorry for Gregory McKenna. The bus conductor? Yes. His wife was a drunk. She called him a dirty immigrant, but when he fell in love with another woman and asked for a divorce, she just laughed at him. No wonder he picked up that rolling pin and hit her. Until she was dead. Uncle Dan? If you were planning to kill someone, how would you do it? <laughs> Tired of May, are you? Well, of course not. I'm just interested how you'd do it. Play you around a fox and hounds, you'd be the fox. No. A fox never has a chance. Exactly. Same thing with murder. <laughs> if they know it's murder, that is. <laughs> How do you mean? Well, you don't let them know, do you? Under a train in the rush hour, non-swimmer drowning in the pool after one too many, faulty gas tap. Any use? <laughs> of course not. Have you seen a doctor, Johnny Boy? What for? One of those blackouts and... Oh, and I shouldn't think too much about Sheila Morton if I were you. From what I hear, she's been a bit of a Sheila in her time. All right. Jack called Bill Lonergan, then Leslie Jackson from the tennis club. All right. <coughs> Love to May. Well, I mean, really. Bill Lonergan was Sheila's cousin. And as for Leslie Jackson... What so? I went to the library again. We've got a couple of new Moira Maleveras in, if your invalid sister would like them. Uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so you tried it on. Forget it. Now, do you want the books or not? What? Oh, no. Just these. Okay. You're looking very happy today. Well, I am, actually. I've just got... Well, I've... I've just fixed up our summer holiday. Daddy's and mine. Oh. First two weeks in June, Dr Brighton's just what he needs. Me too. I love sunbathing, don't you? Won't you be lonely? Oh, I expect I shall find something to occupy my time. Where are you staying? The Langland. Well, goodbye for now. Yes, for now. <laughs> Was I wrong for thinking I had received an almost open invitation? Mr. Gimble was surprisingly agreeable to my having the first two weeks of June for my holiday. 
I booked a room at the Prince Regent. It was where May and I had spent our honeymoon. Sheila and I could be together at last, sunbathing. And then, when it got dark, lying together on the beach, very close, while I whispered the sort of words I never say out loud. So, Sheila was quite happy to go with you to the beach? It was a fantasy. We all have fantasies. But I never really dreamed that I might do harm to anyone. How about going for a swim, May? Oh, no, I couldn't. Not on our first day. Why should that matter? It just does. I mean, you have to get used to the sea air, don't you? Well, what would you like to do then? Well, I don't really mind. What would you like to do? I was asking you what you wanted to do. There must be something. Well, we could go and look at the pier. Would you like that? I'm asking you. If you want to go on the pier, let's go. There's no need to snap my head off just because I don't want to go in the water. I doubt you'll be wanting to go and get changed for lunch soon, anyway. Are you saying you don't like my frock? No. It's just I remember that's what you spent all your time doing on a honeymoon. Changing out of one outfit into another. But now you mention it, salmon pink really isn't your colour. I knew that's what you meant. I'm going back to change it right now. May, there's no need to... The receptionist says there's been a gentleman asking for us. What sort of gentleman? This sort of gentleman? Uh, Uncle Dan! <laughs> right, first time. Come all the way down to London on sea to take the lovebirds out to lunch. <laughs> but we've already paid to have lunch here. So live a little. I know where to get the most exotic food in Brighton, not to mention the odd pre-prandial corpse reviver. I've never cared for strong drink, and John should... I meant I... a drop of sherry. Come on, mate. Let's go. It sounds fun. Yeah, come on. <laughs> oh, drink out, Johnny. Boy, drink out. Oh, that was magnificent, Uncle Dan. Just uh, uh, magnificent. <laughs> May, you've only eaten the rice. Uh, what about your stir-fried toss? What about your, your pancake roll? <laughs> no, thank you. I had to know what I'm putting in my mouth. You can't see what they're made of. Oh, how about something visible to follow then? Uh, something slippery and very sweet. <laughs> How about some ginger, May? <laughs> I'd be getting back now, if you don't mind. I have rather a bad headache. Very good for the wind. Well, oh, really? Now, I'll get the bill. Now, don't let that whiskey get the better of you, Johnny boy. Drink up and on to the next water hole. No, no, you both stay here. I don't want to spoil your enjoyment. Not much enjoyment to spoil. I'm going back to the hotel to lie down. <clears throat> Terrible woman. Not surprised you want a murderer. Oh, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> Let's go and have an honest glass of beer. I won't, if you don't mind. Um, I, want, I want to go for a walk and clear my head. How about a drink this evening? Half past six at the Lord Providence, yeah? Uh, half past six it is. Oh, and thanks for the lunch. It was magnificent, really. Out on the front, I turned right and began to walk past the Mercado, past the Grand Hotel, not thinking where I was going. I swear I was surprised when I came to Little North Street. I stopped and stared. Twenty yards along, there was a sign winking at me. The Langland. Miss Morton, please. Oh, yes, of course, sir. Room 23 on the first floor. She is expecting you, sir. I knew it! Sir? John Wilkins. You were expecting me. What? <laughs> you didn't think I'd remember, but I did, so here I am. I... I can't take this in. Johnny Wilkins? Yes. Oh. My God, it is. Remember the school cricket? Bill Lonergan. You won't have forgotten me, I'll bet. No. Look, can't you see my father's ill? The last thing he needs is this sort of intrusion. What are you doing here? 
I'm on holiday. And oh, here, in this room. They told me to come straight up. They must have thought he was Leslie. You know Leslie? Leslie Jackson? At the tennis club. But why should he... Because he's my fiancé. We got engaged last week. Congratulations. When you heard father had had another heart attack, he nearly died yesterday. Anyway, Leslie will be here soon, and I... I really... Sheila, I... Come on, Johnny. Um, Come and have a drink. But, but... Sheila... Goodbye, uh, John. We... Let's we... leave Sheila in peace. When the nurse comes, I'll go for a walk. Get some fresh air. Good idea. Come on, Johnny. God, how I hate sick rooms. It's something strong to take the taste away. Double whiskey? Yes. Two double whiskies. The old boys had it, of course. Sheila called me up in Brum and told me my presence was required. Oh. Your presence? Well, after Sheila, I'm his nearest relative. Only relative, in fact. Thanks, love. Yeah, he wanted me to stick around, take over the business. Didn't say so, of course. But I wanted to make my own way. Cheers. Cheers. You uh, know Nalong, Sheila? She used to come and watch the school cricket. I don't remember that. Wife with you, is she? You are married, of course. Yes, and May is with me. Hard luck. What are you doing, then, calling in on Sheila? I... Don't answer. The way you looked at her said it all. When she said she was engaged, well, the words head and sledgehammer came to mind. He's not good enough for her. You know him well, then, do you, Leslie Jackson? I almost beat him at tennis. Oh, well, say no more. Sheila's a nice girl, but... uh... The only trouble is she just hates to disappoint people. It's as simple as that. I know. I've had some. <laughs> so have I. <laughs> I was as good as engaged to Sheila. Did she know you were married? Oh, yes. Not at first, of course. And it was a big shock to her when she found out. She was pretty keen, if you know what I mean. I shouldn't have done it, I suppose. But my wife, well... <laughs> While Sheila was... Not so loud. I mean, Sheila, well, there was no stopping her. People are looking. (coughs) Another drink? No. You're just like her. Saying no when you mean yes. Two more double whiskies. No, my wife's a bitch. Doesn't like sex at all. But Sheila... Shut up. uh, Sheila was quite different. I said shut up. And that's the last thing I can remember, Dr. Andreatis. At 20 minutes to seven, I left the lock and key. I remember nothing more. Nothing. Until I woke up in my bedroom at the hotel next morning. I'm not a rich woman, Mr. Likeness, but I am prepared to spend every penny I have to defend John. (laughs) Well, let's hope that you won't quite have to do that. Your son is most anxious that we engage Magnus Newton as counsel. Never heard of him. Well, your son was impressed by his conduct of a case involving a man called McKenna. So, are you agreeable that I approach him? I suppose so. Then, who's this chap who's been calling in on John every day? Ah, Dr. Andreadis is a psychiatrist. You mean, you think he's guilty? And you want the doctor to say that he's mad? Come on, come on, old girl. The more we know about your son's emotional state, the more we should be in a position to help him. Mr. Magnus Newton has agreed to take your case, but if he is to help you... I knew he would. Yes, uh... 
Well, your movements between half past six and the time you got back to your hotel are essential to provide you with an alibi. Why? Suppose I did it. What? Uh, of course, I couldn't have. Not if I'd been myself. But when I have the blackouts, I'm not myself. Something else takes possession of me. About your marriage, um, you've told Dr. Andreadis it wasn't happy. I made a good home for May. China milkmaids on the mantelpiece. A hostess trolley. I I'm referring more to your emotional needs. I don't know that May had any emotional needs. Mr. Wilkins, the prosecution may suggest that you, um, that you showed violence to her on one occasion. I hate May. The way she ate toast and marmalade. I hate her. I must congratulate you, Doctor, on producing a, a veritable life history. Oh, getting him to talk required no skill. It was something of a relief to him, Mr. Newton. Mm. And for his defense, something of a problem. What kind of witness would he make? He is presentable, of average intelligence, and he makes a great effort to be honest. How about insanity? Uh, what? Well, you've spent days holed up with him. Is he sane or not? That is not a clear-cut question. Wilkins is a borderline personality with deep feelings of inferiority. He indulges in fantasies where he can see himself in a better light. And perhaps when these fantasies fail him, he takes refuge in fits of amnesia. So, members of the jury, you have heard how early on the morning of Tuesday the 5th of June, the body of Sheila Morton was found murdered on Brighton Beach. Her head and face had been savagely beaten with a blunt instrument. Her clothes were torn and there were scratches on the insides of her legs consistent with an attempted sexual assault. The medical experts cannot place the time of death more precisely than to say that it took place between 10.30 and midnight. The night before, leaving her seriously ill father in the care of a nurse, Miss Morton went for a walk alone. We can find nobody who saw her after she left the hotel. Perhaps the defence will suggest that this murder was likely to have been committed by the passing tramp, much favoured by fiction writers. If so, I should like you to remember this. Sheila Morton was a friendly girl, but she was a virgin. Is it likely that she would have gone to the beach with a stranger? Then the murderer would certainly have had blood on his person. Bloodstains of the same group as Miss Morton's, that is, Group O. And the same group as Mr Wilkins, as it happens. On the Tuesday afternoon, Detective Inspector Kenning interviewed Wilkins at his hotel. Hanging on the back of a chair, he noticed a sports jacket. There were some dark stains on the sleeve which appeared to be blood. The prisoner said that he had cut his thumb. <laughs> Members of the jury, John Wilkins, after experiencing one of his blackouts, still managed to remember something as trivial as a cut thumb. Yet when D.I. Kenning asked him did he not then perhaps remember the battering to death of Sheila Morton, he replied, No, no, I loved Sheila and I'd never have hurt her if I'd been in my right mind. It's true, I loved Sheila. I loved her, Dr Andreadis. <laughs> Why don't they believe me? <laughs> like being back at school, running. <clears throat> you win a race, and then they say you haven't. So you have to try even harder running after a taxi, running after a girl, because they're just the same, aren't they? Are they? What? No. Yes. Me clean bowling Bill Lonigan and me killing Sheila. No. Because it's the other way around. Like throwing a great chunk of iron railing. That's cool. Cool. Your name is William Lonergan, and you are the cousin of the deceased? That's right. And you were present in the suite at the Langland Hotel, occupied by Sheila Morton and her father, when John Wilkins arrived there on the evening of her death? Yes. 
Can you describe the prisoner's manner? He acted as though we were expecting him, which we weren't. We didn't even know he was in Brighton. But he soon dropped the bravado when he heard of Sheila's engagement. Was he shocked by the news? He looked like a poleaxed sheep. And then he agreed to go out for a drink with you. Mr Lonergan, just before you left, what was said? Sheila said as soon as the nurse arrived, she'd go for a walk on her own, get some fresh air. Did anything special happen when the prisoner and Miss Morton said goodbye? Wilkins took hold of her hand and wouldn't let it go. She actually had to drag it away from him. So then you and he went to the uh, lock and key for a drink? Yes. Double whiskies. Was John Wilkins noticeably drunk by this stage? I wouldn't say that. He started going on about what a terrible shock it had been for Sheila when she'd found out that he was married. Can you remember his exact words? Uh, I'm not sure. Something like, I shouldn't have done it, I suppose. That is, shouldn't have gone out with Miss Morton without telling her he was married? Yes. Shouldn't have done it, but my wife's a bitch. She doesn't like sex, but Sheila was quite different. I told him to shut up and left. Mr. Lonergan, you were engaged to Sheila Morton yourself at one time, I believe. Well, sort of. Did you bring it off, or did she? Neither. It, it wasn't a formal engagement. But you still had feelings for Miss Morton. When the prisoner began to talk about her in the way you describe, you were angry. Well, of course I was. You were at school with Wilkins, is that right? Yes. Sir, can you remember any incident when he showed signs of violence? In horseplay? On the sports field? No. Not that I can remember. You see, Bill Lonergan said nothing about how he... It's the blackouts. They whistle past your head. You can't remember a thing. Don't you find that? I'm not sure. I said some of those things. I did some of those things. The love I felt for Sheila was real. But it was also a sort of game. Mr. Fanham, would you please tell the court exactly what you saw on the night of Monday, June the 4th? Well, I'd been to visit a friend in Hove and I was walking back along the promenade. Everything was very quiet, and then I heard this terrible laugh, like the sound of a wolf howling, and yet it was a laugh. What time was this? Twenty minutes to twelve. And what did you see? A man. He was walking up the steps from the beach. His face was ghastly pale, and he staggered as though he was ill or drunk. Did you see his face clearly? Yes, I did. He stopped under a street lamp, holding on to it as though for support. It was John Wilkins. Thank you, Mr. Fanham. So, you had been visiting your friend in Hove, with whom you'd spent, presumably, an enjoyable evening. Very enjoyable, yes. Mm. We had supper and then a game of billiards. Anything to drink? A bottle of beer. I never have more than one. I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Fanham. Still, how can you be so absolutely certain that it was at 20 to midnight that you saw John Wilkins? I looked at my watch. It's never wrong. Never, Mr. Fanham? Not in 25 years. And you uh, heard this terrible sound. Uh, could you tell us again what it was like? It was like the laugh of a hyena when it has its prey at its mercy. <laughs> When were you last in Africa? I have never been outside England in my life. Really? Then how do you know what a hyena sounds like when crouched over its prey? I... well, I... And then you saw a man coming up the steps from the beach. Did you notice what he was wearing? Yes, a sports jacket and trousers. Was there any blood on them? Oh, the light wasn't good enough. But it was good enough for you to recognise John Wilkins. A man you had never seen before. No. Mr. Fanham, did you happen to see any photographs of the prisoner in the newspapers before you made your identification? 
I may have done. Mr. Phantom, I suggested you heard this very unnerving laugh, which you can't exactly describe. It was a murderer's laugh. That laugh had the colour of murder in it. So naturally, the next person you saw had to be a murderer. And when you saw his picture in the newspaper, it had to be John Wilkins. Do you agree now that you cannot swear to the identification? I saw him. I saw John Wilkins. And that laugh had in it the colour of murder. What's happening? Who are all these people? I don't know any of them. Not Bill Lonergan. And Sheila's father, he was there too. I saw him. But I can't have done. Why not? Because he's dead. Mr. Morton is alive. And he was in court today. So then Sheila isn't... I mean, that night on the beach. We have a new witness. Our man has traced Wilkins' movements on the night of the murder to a pub called the Diving Bell and has come up with a Miss Betty Prenton. Ah. Apparently Wilkins went home with her and, uh, well, anyway, it was while he was with her that he acquired the cut thumb. I'll give you three guesses how. I'll forego the suspense. Opening a tin of baked beans. Mm. Is she prepared to give evidence? <sighs> Reluctant. wife says you arrived back at your hotel at 25 minutes to 12. And since Miss Prenton says that you left her flat at just after 11... I still have time to do it. Betty Prenton. Who is she? She's a prostitute. Disgusting. I picked him up. In the bell. I felt sorry for him. And you took him back to your flat? He said he only wanted to talk. He told me about his wife and this girl he'd been following round. He cried. I offered him some beans on toast. I'm trying to act the gent, he opened the tin for me and cut his thumb. Did any blood from the cut get onto his jacket? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Are you sure this is important? Why else do you think I'm here? Appearing in court does no good to somebody in my profession. We are grateful for your sense of public duty. Are we to understand, Miss Prenton, that you were engaged in your profession when you met John Wilkins in the diving bell? He offered to buy me a drink. I accepted. As I've said, nothing happened. So you said, put your money away, John, I'll make you some baked beans on toast. And it was then that he cut his thumb. I was watching the toast, and when I turned round, his hand was all over blood. From a little cut on his thumb? Am I telling you, or are you telling me? Now, I think some went on his clothes before he held his hand under the tap and wrapped a handkerchief round it. But you were too busy cooking baked beans to be sure. So, you're more used to having sirloin steak for your supper. Well, lucky you. I'm not ashamed of having baked beans. Like, I'm not ashamed of how I make my living. It's more honest than yours. <coughs> She's lying. I don't know her. And she doesn't know me. The real me. The me who loved Sheila. Mrs Wilkie. Was your marriage a happy one? Very happy. And with John's work prospects... What did you feel about these blackouts that he had? I was very worried, naturally. Mm. They could have affected his chance of promotion. I said he should go straight to the doctor, but of course he had his own ideas. Were you aware of Miss Morton's existence at this time? I was not. But you suspected that something was wrong. Why was that? John asked me what I thought about divorce. Yes? He said he thought that when two people fell out of love, they ought to get divorced. He tried to pretend he wasn't talking about us, but I knew he was. What was your reaction? I told him that even if he'd been unfaithful, I'd never give him up. That once he was promoted, we could buy a little car and then... Well, everything would be all right. And that I loved him, of course. So was it then that he suggested a holiday together uh, in Brighton? Yes. John insisted on Brighton because it was where we'd spent our honeymoon. And did this holiday lead to a happier prospect for your marriage? No. He was in a bad mood from the moment we arrived. So by the evening of June the 4th, you were worried about your husband, Mrs Wilkins? Very worried. On that particular day, I'd seen nothing of him since lunch. I supposed he must be on a pub crawl with his Uncle Dan. What time did your husband arrive back at your hotel room? At 
25 minutes to 12. I looked at my little bedside clock when he came in. What happened? He seemed dazed and his breath smelt drink. It was then I noticed the cut on his hand. And his jacket? Yes. I said, look, you've even got blood on your jacket. What was his reaction to that? He snatched it away from me and hung it over the back of the chair. Did he seem alarmed that you'd seen the blood? No. Did he make any attempt to clean it off? He did not. Thank you, Mrs. Wilkins. You know, don't you, Mrs. Wilkins, that the hall porter says that your husband came in at ten minutes to twelve. He is mistaken. When your husband came in, did you switch on the light? No. Ah. It was already on. I was sitting up reading. Right. You said, Mrs. Wilkins, that there was blood on your husband's hands. Did you mean on both his hands? There was quite a lot of blood on his right hand, and I'm almost sure there was some on his left. Was there, by any chance, a handkerchief wrapped around his right thumb? I didn't see one. John? What? Can you hear me? You're a long way away. Today, you go into the witness box. But where are you going? All you have to do is tell the truth. That's a funny word. Truth. A funny sound. Truth. True, 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 true. <laughs> truth. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> Mr. Wilkins, my learned friend has told the court that you said you would never have hurt Sheila Morton if I had been in my right mind. What did you mean by that? I'd had a blackout. It was in no sense a confession. No. Before God, I loved Sheila Morton, and I never meant to hurt her. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. About these blackouts, am I right in thinking that a kind of shutter comes down over your mind so you can remember absolutely nothing afterwards? Yes. Frightening. Particularly if it was affecting your work. I'd have gone straight to my doctor. What was that? <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? I didn't want to see a doctor because I knew they were caused through drink. So you were afraid of what your doctor might discover? Perhaps that you had a violent streak and that you drank to cover it. No, no. Even your wife had asked you to see your doctor. My wife put you up to this. She hates me. We will leave this matter and move on to the subject of Sheila Morton's engagement. What were your feelings on hearing this news? I was upset. Did you feel betrayed? I don't know. Afterwards you went out for a drink with Mr Lonergan. Do you remember what you said to him? You implied that Sheila Morton had been your mistress and Mr Lonergan told you to shut up. Is that correct? More or less. In fact, it was not true that you had been intimate with Sheila Morton, was it? No. You had been out with her only once. She had no intention of going out with you again and now she was engaged to be married. Those are the facts, aren't they? I suppose so. But they're not the truth. I suggest to you that the truth was the very thing you were unable to face. Are you really asking us to believe that this fantasy was invented out of love for Sheila Morton? Was it not rather an expression of lust? A lust that turned to hatred. A hatred that later that evening you felt compelled to turn into a hideous reality. No! 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 The jury's been out for nearly an hour. Must mean a disagreement. Odds on a not guilty verdict now, I'd say. They can't find my son guilty. Of course not. Yeah, well, I'm just going to uh, stretch my legs in the court. Miss Brenton. Uh, Miss Brenton. I, I, uh... I'll say thank you. 
You were wonderful. It took courage, the way Haley treated you. He was only doing his job. You think John's guilty, don't you? I don't know. He didn't do it. I can feel it here. They're coming back. Come on. Oh, come on. Well, something's happening. Let's go back. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. How do you find? Is the prisoner guilty or not guilty? We find the prisoner guilty. <laughs> May's off to Devon on Saturday with her next door neighbours. She'll get her holiday after all. Hmm. Well, now, what do you want us to do? Do? Oh, you know, I don't go in for holidays. No, about an appeal. An appeal? Yeah. Are we going to dig up fresh evidence? That kind of caper? What for? They found out he did it. But yesterday you said John that... John killed that woman. They said so. My son is a murderer. No, I've got a headache and... Going upstairs to lie down. John, do you remember me? Betty Prenton. They told you I was coming, didn't they? I mean, is there anything that you want at all? I've been in prison myself, only for a few days, but I know what it's like. Have you brought me a message? A message? Yeah. From Sheila. Sheila? What? It's been such a long time. I know it's probably difficult for her, with her father, to look after them. But if she can't come to see me, can you ask her to write? Well, I'll, I'll see um, if I can get in touch. No. <laughs> Don't go. I've got to get a message to Sheila. To tell her that I love her. All right. <laughs> that I'll go on waiting for well, her. That's enough, no. you? Don't go. I say that's enough. <laughs> I had a feeling, Mr. Newton, that you might visit. Because of the news. But Eternity, after all. But at the time, and according to the rules... He was sane. Mm. Oh, damn, I'm sorry. Uh, Waste of a good shabby. Nothing broken. <sighs> Prison life can make psychopaths of us all. Earlier this month, my wife and I took a holiday along the Adriatic coast. We stayed one night at a little village called Previso. The next morning I went for a walk alone. It was a glorious day and I sat down for a while on a hill overlooking the beach. I... I must have dozed off because the next thing I knew I was being wakened by a terrible noise. A kind of unearthly laugh. Do you remember that witness in the case, that stupid old man, Fanon? Do you remember the laugh he'd said he'd heard? It was like that. I was actually shivering. Anyway, I crawled to the edge and looked over. Just below was a sandy beach with one person on it, a man reading an English newspaper. And he was in paroxysms of laughter, rolling around, even stuffing a handkerchief into his mouth at one point, a man I recognised. So when I got back to Previso, I bought the same newspaper and found a report that old Morton Sheila's father died of a heart attack. And the man you saw on the beach? Oh, 
It was old Morton's nephew, Bill Lonergan. Then he will inherit? No. There is some humour in this. It turns out that the old man changed his will after Sheila died and left all his money to a home for the elderly. Don't you see? On the evening of the murder, old Morton was thought certain to die. Sheila would get all his money, so Lonergan, who'd been engaged to her before, comes straight down from Birmingham to propose again, only to find that Sheila has just become engaged to Leslie Jackson. What a shock! Wilkins' insinuations fuel his anger. When Sheila comes out, he meets her. Lonergan is a man she knows and trusts. Lonergan is a man with whom she's happy to take a walk on the beach. Lonergan is the man who kills her. Oh, come on. You said yourself that you weren't sure Wilkins was guilty? Did I? If I can't convince you, I shall convince nobody. Well, Wilkins... But you were not on that hillside, Doctor. You didn't hear that laugh as I did. Nor did you see Bill Lonergan. And I tell you, his laugh had in it the colour of murder. In The Colour of Murder by Julian Simmons, dramatised by Yvonne Antrobus, John Wilkins was played by Tom Smith, Sheila Morton by Lydia Leonard, and May by Claire Corbett. Mrs Wilkins was played by Francis Jeter, Uncle Dan by Don McCorkendale, Newton by Geoffrey Whitehead, and Haley by Andrew Harrison. Bill Lonergan was played by Ben Crow, Dr Andreadis by Yoan Meredith, and Mr. Likeness by Chris Moran. The director was Claire Grove.